Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show, Mr. Andy Schechtman. Andy is the owner and president of Miles Franklin LTD. Miles Franklin is a full-service precious metals company specializing in the sale of bullion, whether it is gold or silver or creative strategies for diversifying everybody's investments. Andy is one of the best experts in the industry when it comes to precious metals. And we are excited to have him here today because we are hearing rumors from around the world of people having difficulty in receiving their physical orders of silver from mints everywhere. So this is going to be a very interesting show to find out what is going on behind the scenes and whether it will affect anyone here in the United States. Andy, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm great, Michelle. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, we are always thrilled to have you here. And usually, you know, we start off with prices, but those have been somewhat stable lately, which makes this first topic all that more mysterious because we are hearing that mints around the world are having challenges delivering their physical silver. Have you heard anything about this and what's happening? Yeah, you know, look, uh, uh, Price is a tool of misdirection. There is no question, but that price has been controlled on various levels. And we can get into that a little bit, especially going back to February 1st and 2nd, which would really underscore what I'm trying to say. But as far as your question regarding um, supply and delivery issues, there's a lot of that coming out of the UK and out of Australia. Um, basically what's happening to me anyways, it seems as though that the UK Mint and the Australian Mint are ignoring their local uh, retail business in the UK and in Austri Australia in favor of very large wholesale business here in the United States. You know, the UK and, and uh, the, the Royal Mint in, in the UK and the Perth Mint in Australia, from a, a wholesale standpoint on my side of the ledger, have been fantastic. Um, I can't complain with them. Really, the Perth Mint since 2020 has been almost a savior to Miles Franklin. We, uh, I'm going to back up to 2020 and kind of try to explain how that has worked. But one of the things that we have to do right now, if we go back to 2020 when COVID started in December, my friend Chris Martinson uh, from Peak Prosperity alerted me to it. Now, he's a heck of an economist, but also an epidemiologist and a pathologist and told me about COVID and its reality. And so I got in front of the supply chain issue. One of the things that enables Miles Franklin to always have supply when others don't, and that was a constant theme in 2020, people would say, how do you guys have supply? No one else does. Those other companies, most of them have been around for about a decade, which for a small business is great. We started in 1989 and we have supply chain uh, tentacles that go deep all around the globe. Uh, most of these big online companies work with one or two distributors. We work with all of the distributors around the globe, many of them, including all the major mints and uh, refineries and even small coin shops around the globe, around the United States, rather, a whole myriad of almost 1,500 small coin shops that send us all of their business. But as it pertains to, for example, the Perth Mint, where a lot of this is coming about, since 2020, what we've had to do is typically pay for uh, allocations as much as three months in advance and with large sums of money with high premiums, higher premiums than I've ever paid as a business owner in 31 years. So basically what they're saying is if you're going to pay up front, pay super high premiums and give us a 90 day lag time, you'll get your product. And it, and it has happened. We have gotten product We've gotten tremendous number of, of Australian kangaroos, and the same thing can be said with the UK Britannias. But I do hear what you're talking about. I see it repetitively. I have a relationship with the Wall Street Silver Group, and, and a lot of that is coming up on, on their Reddit page, talking about uh, silver not being delivered um, in, in Perth. A lot of talk is also coming around the Perth Mint program itself, the certificate program. There are two different ways that people hold metal at the Perth Mint. One is allocated, one is unallocated. In the 31 years I've done this, I've met two people 
two who own it in an allocated fashion and have it stored. Most people own the unallocated version, which carries no storage fees. And it is just what it sounds like. It's not allocated. It's not in Michelle Holiday's name. It's in, it's a pooled account. It's a, it's a liability on the balance sheet of the Perth who says, yes, Michelle, you own this amount of gold or silver. And if you want it, the only way you get it is to first fabricate it and then allocate it if you want to have it stored or have it sent to you. So imagine, now I'm just using your name, you don't have a Perth account, I'm just using it for, for the sake of argument. If you had an unallocated account at Perth, which most people do, uh, in fact, 99% of the people I've ever talked to who have it own the unallocated account. Now, the only thing that I'd like to say is that in this industry, if it's for free, you better think twice because I've run a Brink storage facility program in North America now for 10 years and nothing is free. I'll tell you that right now, nothing is free. There is no free lunch in this world. I mean, there is the cost of ma maintaining a program. You have the labor cost. Um, you have the cost of the brick and mortar. You have the insurance, you have everything. So nothing's for free. Um, but, you know, uh, if you want to take possession of your Perth Mint certificate, you first have to fabricate it. And basically what's happening or what's being said is that when these people are requesting fabrication, they're being told three, four, five, six months, you need to get to the back of the line. Now, what does that mean? I don't know what that really means. Does that mean that they have so much demand in wholesale business that you can't quickly fabricate? Does that mean that they don't have enough product? Don't know. But what I will tell you is this, if the, you know what hits the fan, that's the last place you want to be. If you believe that you have these programs specifically so that you can access your metal when you need it, then what good does it do you if you go to the back of the line when you want to fabricate? What it seems like to me more than anything, it's, it's a representation of price and a better one than the, in the ETFs for sure. But when the, when the rubber meets the road and you really need to take possession of it, at least right now, there are a lot of delays. Now, this same thing happened last year. Uh, there's a, a, a wonderful gal. Her name is Shay Russell. Uh, she runs uh, the Agora division, or one of the Agora uh, newsletter divisions in Australia. And she interviewed me last year. I've, I've known her for a few years. And uh, last year, the same thing she was telling me that we're seeing today, but it was with gold. And she was telling me that people could not get gold Perth Mint products in Australia, yet we were getting them here in the U.S. And the Perth Mint sent a whole truckload or shipload of a kilo gold bars to the COMEX at this exact same time. So it's been a constant theme of somewhat ignoring the small retail business, difficulty converting unallocated to allocated through fabrication in favor of large North American wholesale business. What does that portray for the future of their supply? I don't know, but, um, I will tell you that the stories that you're hearing, I'm hearing in spades. And, and oftentimes where there's smoke, there's fire. There's a gentleman named John Adams who is in Australia and writes a lot about this and has been writing a lot about this lately. He's contacted me personally. I know him. He's validating this stuff. Uh, he's saying it's true. Now, that's just one person. I don't know for a fact. All I can say is I'm reading the same things that you are. But, you know, when you, when you hear an isolated instance, okay, but when you hear 12, 13, 14, 20, 50 people saying the same thing, you got to kind of wonder, is this happening? Now, what I will tell you, Michelle, is that in the, in the 31 years I've done this, I've never seen more demand, ever, ever. And there's a, a progression that I just would kind of like to, to, to touch on, and then I'll let you... Uh, take it from here. I know this is kind of a long-winded answer, but no, go in 1980... Not everything you have to say, we want to hear. Trust me. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. So in 1980, uh, in the United States anyway, we had uh, eight, 850 gold and 850 Dow. That was the last time that the Dow and the gold crossed one-to-one -one, uh, at 850. And back then, really, no one wanted Dow stocks. They just wanted gold coins and silver dollars. And at that point, there was an 8 percent allocation to precious metals across the entire United States financial matrix. And when we're talking Joe Sixpack all the way up to the Harvard Endowment Fund and everything in between had 8% of those assets in precious metals. By December 2020, right before COVID started, that number had decreased all the way down to one half of 1% allocation. Virtually no one owned it. And so 
if we were to take an average or the mean of those 40 years, that's two and a half percent. Now, I would argue since 2020, that number has regressed, begun to regress to the mean. If it only got to two and a half percent, and I doubt we're there yet, that would be a five-fold increase in the amount of demand that this industry is trying to absorb and absorb. And, you know, maybe it's at one percent now. Maybe it's at one and a half. Well, that would be a double or a triple. And I'll tell you that in terms of business, uh, we've done a year's worth of business so far already in the first two and a half months. We've done in normal years, a whole year's worth of business, almost a hundred million dollars in sales. Now that's highly, highly, highly unusual. Uh, and, but it's indicative of the amount of demand that is out there. Uh, people are looking to precious metals for the first time ever. And whether it be the Reddit group, whether it be the awakening through cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, people looking at at the dollar and, and what it means to see cryptocurrencies rise, um, there is an awakening. And, you know, I think everything in life is a circle. Uh, it, it, it goes in a circle and has its time and, you know, it, it, it goes full circle. And we are coming to a point in time where I think people are realizing that you should have a little bit of precious metals in your portfolio because it's wealth, it's a hedge, it's a protection against all of the things that we see around us, inflation, deflation, money creation, instability, unknown. There's a million things, why, reasons why you should own precious metals. And I think people are waking up to that. And I guess as a caveat, I'd like to simply say the reason I own it, because it's wealth. It's been wealth for 5,000 years. When I started this company in 1989, I was 19 years old. And my father and I started it on a wing and a prayer, literally. My dad's middle name is Miles and his best friend who loaned us 60 grand to start the company in a one room office, his middle name was Franklin. We bought him out. Recently, we eclipsed $6 billion without a customer complaint. We've done things the hard way. Uh, It's the American dream. Um, Hard work, never had a customer complaint ever. And we did it by, you know, the golden rule, just do what you would want done for yourself. And, And that's really how we did it. But I'm getting at is that when I started, I was 19 and knew nothing. And my dad said to me, there'll be one rule and one rule only. And maybe this is part of the reason why we've been successful because of the way we look at precious metals. And I'm hoping this is the way that this growing expansive um, realization is, is looking at it also. And that is, he told me that every two weeks I'll buy something. That's the only rule or he'll fire me. Well, I can deal with that. I said, dad, back then. And Every two weeks now for 31 years, even though I own the company and I'm the president of the company and I won't be fired by him any longer, I've honored my word and I bought something every two weeks for 31 years. To me, it's wealth. And I hope that's the way people are looking at it. And and part of me believes that they are. They're looking at it as historic wealth that has outlived every pandemic, German hyperinflation, the Great Depression, two world wars, and still is a mutable value. And I think that's the way people need to look at it. And there is an awakening. So when we talk about the product not being delivered and the availability being questioned, well, I would say we are regressing to the mean. More and more people are owning it. And even if it only is 2% or 1.5%, that's a two or a three or a fourfold increase in demand in an industry where recency bias would have us not prepared or equipped for that kind of demand. And what happens if it goes to five or 10%? When that happens, there'll be nothing available for anybody else. And that really is what I take away from all of this. And I do believe that there is a modicum of truth in what you are asking. I just can't really put my finger and validate it completely and totally because I don't have the empirical proof. But I will tell you that there are a lot of people saying that this is what is happening. And it's such a key point that so many people are saying it, where there's smoke, there's fire. And that means it is becoming challenging to receive in other portions of the world by people who are buying it individually. Now, you are a wholesaler um, located here in the United States. So you're sort of a, a different breed and you haven't actually experienced this yet. However, the big picture is starting to become very clear. It's also interesting that your client base is starting to change because it used to be that just certain people bought precious metals, categorically speaking, but it's starting to really open up. So that's some great news, too, and very interesting and probably the reason why this is starting to happen. No question. In fact, I there were many nights where, you know, 
wake up in the middle of the night and think to myself, geez, you know, my clients are dying. Uh, they, they own more than, than they need. I mean, when I started at, in 1989 as a 19-year-old kid, uh, I was talking to people our grandfather's age, people who were in, you know, World War II. Um, my biggest client that I ever had was on the neighboring ship to the USS Arizona. I mean, it's, it's uh, first of all, they were some of the most amazing people I've ever had the pleasure of getting to know in every single way. Uh, when you talk about someone's word being their bond, I learned so much from that generation of people. God bless them all, those that are still here. We should all take a lesson from that generation of people where you say something and it's done. You don't question. It's, it's, uh, it, it was a wonderful generation. And, but you're right. Those were the people, by and large, that I was doing business with, uh, gray hairs. And, um, uh, and I wondered about that, actually, especially in 2017 when cryptocurrency and Bitcoin was taking off. And I wondered, is this a dying industry? I, I always knew that it would have validation in central bank circles and in huge money circles. I mean, it's been wealth. You go back to the beginning of time, kings, queens, emperors, pharaohs, it's in the Bible. Go back as far as you want. Anyone of wealth and power own gold and silver, not as an investment, but as a form of immutable wealth to pass on to generations and what have you. But I, I was beginning to believe that, you know, is this something that is kind of a fizzling out business? And you know, God bless the, uh, the Reddit group. They have, um, uh, and I've gotten to know them pretty well and have a nice association with them. And uh, they have given me renewed vigor and confidence that, you know, look, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And again, everything is full circle. And, you know, the millennials who have been given a bad rap are actually pretty darn smart and cohesive and unified and clever. And, uh, and they, they realize here again, I hope, that you make money in other places, in investments like cryptocurrencies, like mining shares, like, you know, Tesla. That's, those are the kind of investments where you make money. Gold is wealth. And, um, and I have really tried hard when I talk to these people to, look, take some profit off the table, like you're playing blackjack and you just want a hand. Put a couple chips in your pocket so that you leave the table with money. Well, the same thing is true here. I'm telling people, look, Take some of your profit. It's not a four-letter word. It's a six-letter word. And put the money in your pocket in gold and silver, which, you know, is wealth. And, and I think they're, they're waking up to this. And the Reddit group is expanding tremendously. And they ask great questions. And they're interested. And basically, I think that, you know, here again, uh, the industry is renewed. And you're right. We have a massive amount of new clients uh, over the last 14 months, many of which are our age or younger. And it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's refreshing and it's enlightening. And uh, I think um, I, I am, you know, I know I'm just thrilled that more people are waking up to what precious metals are not an investment, but wealth. Right. And it's so great for young people to come in because you're right. You know, it was always the older generation that owned, you know, gold and silver and the younger generation. Oh, we don't, you know, we, we invest here and you can't make money fast on that was always the theme. You know what I mean? You know, we're more speculative. But now with the realization economically speaking, and you know, things that are seemingly unconnected, it's not true. Everything's connected in the world. You know, illegal immigration is connected because then we have the money printing and we have the, you know, the way, how are we going to pay for all of them and all of these new programs that are coming in? It's all connected into the way you're going to protect your money. And it's such a great point because you can make a lot of money in cryptos or whatever, the stock of the moment is, and then before it falls, take your money out and put it into gold and silver and then do it again out there someplace else and come back. And it is a store of value. It's a way to protect what you've earned because you sure cannot protect it in fiat currency. No, you can't. I mean, look, people need to realize just what we're doing, all the central banks in the West are doing. But, you know, we've created $4 trillion in the last year. If you go back to September of... Uh, 2019, when the repo market problems hit, it's more like six or seven or eight trillion. I mean, the numbers are, you get different numbers from different people. But look, a trillion seconds ago, Michelle, was 31,688 years ago. 
you talk about just how big these problems are created at the lowest interest rates in human history. And so you have a problem. Um, and the only reason we don't have massive inflation is because we've been fighting a deflationary trend uh, and there's no velocity. And of course, the Fed wants velocity and the Fed will get that if they get their Fed coin, which will enable them to sidestep the way that money is created right now. Money is created right now by lending it into existence. And so when you talk about the, uh, the progression of, of the way that money is created, the Fed does quantitative easing. They buy the, the bonds from the, the commercial banks who then have all this money, who have two choices. Either they lend it or they give it back to the Fed in a reserve account, earning a little bit of interest. And they don't have to risk lending money into this economy, which has seen so many foreclosures and bankruptcies and people locked down. So instead of sending it into the economy where you, you buy a house, boom, there's money created out of thin air, or you buy a, a car and you take out a loan, boom, there's money created out of thin air. And when you go to the bank to take out a loan and they give you a check, and then you go and take that check and deposit it, to buy a home, your money is created through lending. And if you don't, if it's not lent into existence, it, it, there is no velocity. So all of that money that is created by the Fed, uh, when they create the money to buy the bonds, gets holed up in reserve accounts at the Fed. So there's no velocity. That's why they want this Fed coin so badly so that they can get the velocity going so that they can just give money to the people in their Fed wallet on their iPhone rather than these people having to take out loans in order to create the velocity and to order create money creation. And that's coming, I believe. So what you have is a global tide of deflation pouring down upon the U.S. And, and, and the Fed is doing their best to fight that. And when you don't have cooperation with the commercial banks and they're not playing ball right now, uh, it's a problem. And so we have tremendous amount of money creation. We have inflation that should be much higher. You're seeing it in certain places like uh, in, in lumber, in beef, in energy, like oil is rising and in, in the grains. And there are a lot of places that you see it. But when you can buy an iPhone or a color TV flat screen, you know, for cheaper than ever, people don't really see it. It will get out into the economy at one point. But just look at housing and, and health care and tuition and we're beginning to see it. And when you talk about the amount of money creation, look, it took this country 300 years to create about 800 billion in wealth. And in, in a period of six months, they create $4 trillion. So, you know, it's five times what it took 300 years to create. It is going to happen at some point, the rubber will meet the road. Um, so, you know, these are, these are very challenging times with, uh, without much of a precedent to go by. We're in uncharted waters. And I think people need to trust their gut a little bit and, uh, and, you know, take a step back and realize that, hey, you know, what's happening with the currencies is going to have ramifications at some point. Mother Nature will win at the end. And uh, how it plays out is another question. But when you see this kind of money creation at the lowest interest rates in human history, there will be a price to pay at some point, whether it be through rising interest rates or just that inflation finding its way out into the system as fewer and fewer people or more and more people rather have been unproductive. So you have people sitting at home, not being productive, more money creation. That's the recipe for stagflation, which is uh, rising prices characterized by little or no economic growth. And that's the worst of all possible outcomes. Let's hope that doesn't happen, let alone hyper stagflation. The bottom line is what's happening with the dollar is not good. And it's, uh, it's not a recipe uh, for prosperity. Uh, Weimar Republic and, and, you know, has proven that. You can't print yourself, and so is Zimbabwe. You cannot print yourself into prosperity. You have to make money through labor and work and effort and sweat. And if you don't do that, then, you know, the whole thing falls apart. Now, they've held it together pretty well for a long time. But the, the, the actions that they've taken since 2020 are unprecedented and will have consequences at some point. Uh, and that's why we own precious metals. It's not to get rich. It's to protect ourselves against the destruction of fiat currency. And it, it's happening right in front of us without question. No question about it. And it's so extraordinary that we are watching it. And people like you and I who are going out there and saying this is happening right in front of us. We are watching it. Look at it. There are so many people um, not necessarily, of course, our audience, because they're ferociously 
um, interested in precious metals mm-hmm. and they know what's happening, but the majority of people, because they've never been through anything. And honestly, our education system is so bad. You know, it has nothing to do with the stupidity of people. It has to do with the fact that they were not educated of the truth of finance. We are not taught how to handle money, how to no. make money. What happens if you do X, Y, or Z? X being printing money into oblivion. But then again, we're watching it happen. We ha- watched mm. it happen in, you know, Zimbabwe, you just mentioned, Venezuela, you know, just in the past decade or so. People just, this is the, you know what, this is the era of information, Andy. Everything there is to know sits in the palm of your hand. And yet people, they take a meme and they think they know everything instead of taking two seconds and getting the real story. That's the real shame here. That's why people do not see what is coming. Well, not only that, you know, and I agree with everything you just said. God bless people like you because, you know, people like you are getting the word out there, the information out there, and it's harder to do. A lot of good people who I've who I've been associated with were, were kicked off of YouTube for whatever the word was, they're kicked off. And that's just not fair either. And a lot of people that I know that are very smart and very well read, but don't see things the way that I do even remotely. And I would argue they just read the wrong things. And if all you do is focus on mainstream media as your information source, you're in trouble. And even Fox, I mean, Fox is better than the others. But you're never going to get the true scoop. And, uh, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about alternative media. You know, uh, my son goes to the Ross School of Business in uh, Michigan. Uh, it's one of the top two or three business schools in the world and top five. And I'm honored and happy that he went there. And, um, but it's $70,000 a year. It's ridiculous. And it's completely and totally absurd and ridiculous. And, and I'm very resentful when they're, you know, football coach makes 10 million a year and yet we got to pay 70 grand. And that's just, that's not just the raw school. That's just the university of Michigan as an outstate tuition. And the only reason I sent him there is because he was one of only 500 kids in the country to get into Ross. But the point that you made is, 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 is really well, it, it's not lost on me. There's a part of me that thought deep down, like, you know, You got a college education on your iPhone. If you just want to listen to people and study what's out there, you can have a college level education without paying for it. Now, obviously, the world looks at at things a little bit differently. But my point to you is that you're right. Uh, I think that you would learn more from the School of Hard Knocks and spending time listening to people like you and all the wonderful commentators out there in the alternative media space you'd have a better education than the raw school of business would provide. And it's for free. And that's what people need to understand is that if we spent as much time learning about protecting our wealth and investing it as we did making it, we'd all be a whole lot better off. The problem is we're all so exhausted at the end of the day, coming home, trying to earn a paycheck that who's got time to sit down and listen and read. Well, most people don't and it's to their own detriment. Uh, But I would simply say what you said there really resonates with me quite a bit. And, you know, uh, that's why I'm I'm so proud to be associated with people like you and and all the great people out there that I work with because they're making a difference and they're giving people a lifetime worth of education for free. And and that needs to be acknowledged and, and praised because that really is one of the differences of this time. And it allows you to be a free thinker uh, instead of being, one of the sheep that's led into the, you know, the pen to be slaughtered. And I say that I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful uh, to the mainstream out there. I'm just simply saying that to be a free thinker, you are one of one of a few um, instead of one of many. And I've always followed that myself. I've always trusted my gut. I've always uh, marched to a different beat and having the ability to talk with people like you who, spend their, their, it's their life mission to, to get information out that we all need to hear. It, it really is a blessing. And I think people need to understand that and, and spend a little bit more time um, trying to preserve your money and learn about it than just make it. And I think everyone will be better off if they dedicated 20 minutes a day listening to a couple YouTubes and 
you know, hearing a different, a different take on what's happening than what we see on the local uh, evening news, I think people would be a whole lot more enlightened uh, and a whole lot more prepared for whatever it is that's coming next. It's such a great point that it's so hard right now just to keep your head above water, let alone going out and searching for what's the truth, you know what I mean? Because so many people are in situations where they're trying to pay their rent and pay their bills and, you know, keep their children happy. And and the the stress of what's happened in the world right now has just exponentially uh, mounted that to the, you know, 1,000th power. So what's happening right now is really a shame in the world. Um, But it's really good to be able to say to people, you know, we've pulled this all together for you. This is what is happening. Mainstream media may be telling you one thing, but you got to be prepared so that this is not a surprise. That's the problem is that what's happening in front of us, they are printing it into oblivion. They're doing it in an obvious way. Everyone knows it. There's a plan in motion because they know they're doing it too. They know there's a change coming. Either A, we turn into Venezuela and everything falls, or B, Fed coin or some kind of massive change is going to hit apparently out of the blue. But the point is, this is not out of the blue. This is being prepared for, and so everybody, because we don't know the details, we know there's a plan, we're just not privy to it, and therein lies the importance of gold and silver and protecting yourself so that no matter what it is, A, B, C, or D, you are ready, right? I think that's the key. Yeah, and and if you go back to 2017, and this is something I've really talked about ad nauseum for the last year because I believe it needs to be talked about, and people need to understand. When I um, I started in this industry in 1989, and we started as a company that recommended Swiss investments. We were a U.S. contact, still are, for a company called BFI Consulting out of Zurich, and we our business was Swiss investments. I spent the first couple of years in this industry, my first couple of summers when I was 19, 20, and 21 in Zurich learning our business and learning from, from Swiss bankers. And, um, you know, I, I haven't met a, a banker in the world that wouldn't, a Swiss banker that wouldn't tell you that in the best of times, you should have 10% of your, your assets in precious metals. But I, I say that to you because I'd like to just explain a progression that I've seen uh, over the last several years, and as it pertains to precious metals um, in particular. Um, in, in 2017, it started with the German Bundesbank. And the German Bundesbank requested that all of their gold be sent back from the bank of, or the New York Federal Reserve, rather, which was strange at the time. Uh, no one quite understood it because, well, they just no one understood it. The, the central banks were net sellers of gold. Nobody was buying it. Anyways, they requested it back. Shortly thereafter, the Bank of Hungary, the Bank of Turkey, the Dutch National Bank, the Bank of Austria, the Bank of Poland, on and on and on, all of these big central banks started repatriating their gold from the New York Fed and the Bank of England. In 2018, out of nowhere, after being net sellers of gold in 2017, the central banks bought more gold as a group than they did in the 60 years previously combined. In 2019, the Bank of International Settlements reclassified gold as a tier one reserve asset, which means it was put on equal footing as cash after 75 years of it not being anywhere near that. What that was telling me at that point is that the the biggest money in the world was bringing gold home and levying it to a higher standard. In 2020, last year, On top of all of this happening, you had the International Monetary Fund saying, we want a new Bretton Woods. Well, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, is where uh, the Allies met after World War II to anoint the dollar world reserve, uh, the world world reserve currency. And all the other countries pegged their currency to the dollar. Uh, Well, now you have 190 countries that comprise the IMF saying, we want a new standard. And it's on their website. Then you had what I believe was the most significant event of 2020 that we're seeing in spades here this year, and that is the rise of someone uh, of a group called the Others. Now, on the COMEX report, the Commitment of Traders report on the Commodity Exchange, the Commitment of Traders report is published and it shows the positioning of the largest traders on the Commodity Exchange. And typically, it was on one side, the commercial banks like JP and Citi and Goldman 
And then the other side, the specs, as they were called, the speculators, that would be the hedge funds. Uh, and normally they would balance off. One goes long, one goes short. And that's all you would ever see. But in 2020, we saw a third group of reportables called the others. Now, it's important to understand that the commodity exchange, the COMEX, is used to offset risk. Uh, it's not really used as a delivery mechanism. It's used to offset risk. As an example, if I own, if this is 2,000 ounces of gold and it's in my warehouse, I will sell 2,000 ounces on paper so that if what I have in my warehouse drops in value, what I sold short on paper, it goes up commensurate and vice versa. So I'm always market neutral to uh, with my inventory so that I'm not speculating with with my inventory. Well, um, the the uh, the situation right now is 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 really very different because all of a sudden, when in past maybe two percent of contracts on Comex stood for delivery, these contracts that I hedge my inventory with, I'm never going to take delivery of. They're cash settled as people buy product. I, I settle the 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 Comex portion of it, so I'm always market neutral, but never intending to take possession. Typically, one or 2% of contracts would stand for delivery. Well, uh, in, in 2020, uh, we would see as much delivered off a of COMEX by this third reportable group, the others, which would be sovereign wealth funds and family offices, the wealthiest private investors in the world, standing for as much delivery in a month as we would see in a year, typically. Last year in silver alone, over 300 million ounces was delivered to this group, which would be, or the, these groups, which would be almost a decade worth of deliveries off of COMEX. So look at the progression. For the three years previous, you had the central banks repatriating their gold from the Bank of England and the New York Fed, levying gold to as high of a possible tier status as possible, as good as cash. And now, arguably, the private investors who know the people pulling the strings, the wealthiest private investors in the world, the sovereign wealth funds, and the family offices doing the same thing, but off of COMEX, and they are taking delivery. Now, this last delivery month in March here, we saw some really crazy things here in 2021. We saw over 50 million ounces delivered off of COMEX here again in silver. We saw what's called exchange for physical, which is they take the contract on the COMEX, send it to the London Metals Exchange and deliver it there. Many millions of ounces were done also this month on top of 90 million ounces backdoored out of SLV. And the only people really that can take metal out of SLV are the authorized participants. That would be the big money, the COMEC or the commercial banks. Put it all together, you had over 150 million ounces of silver delivered in March alone. So look at the progression. The biggest, most influential, well-funded, well-informed traders on the globe are looking at gold and silver very differently with the one key difference being give it to me bring it home, give it to me, take it off the exchange. And this month, they're actually pulling it out of the COMEX warehouses. Now, I wondered last year in 2020 why they weren't doing that. In 2020, they were buying it, taking it off of the exchange and leaving it in the warehouse, but in their name with a warrant so no one could touch it. Still made me nervous, wondering why the hell wouldn't they just pull it out of the actual vault, out of the warehouse. That's happening now. Now, who is that? Could it be Tesla? Could it be Apple? Uh, could it be Panasonic? Could it be Samsung? Well, it ought to be, because when we talk about silver, remember, Michelle, it's one of the only assets on the planet that is bracketed tremendously on either side by demand. Almost everything is one or the other, like gold is almost totally monetary, copper almost totally industrial, yet silver has a massive industrial application, you know, from batteries and, and solar and wind and a green new agenda uh, to the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative, and not enough people are talking about this. This is the largest infrastructure project in human history, connecting 65% of human population, 45% of global GDP, connecting Asia and Africa, not just by roads and maritime channels and bridges, but by digital technology, where the need for silver is expansive and growing, and yet it is a depleted asset. But let's not forget about the other side of the equation, the monetary side. You got massive monetary in demand where, where mints around the world are, are, and rumors are that mints can't deliver. And you have all of a sudden a whole new awakening by a whole new group of people. Remember, if we just get to two and a half percent allocation 
in people's portfolio, that's a five-fold increase in demand. And what's two and a half percent of everyone's portfolio? Not much. You know, two and a half cents per dollar in silver and gold? Not much in your investment. My point of it is, is that you have an asset that is depleted in nature, and it is getting much, much harder to find. It's found in, in nature in a form called epithermal, which is really close to the surface. So the big deposits were found long ago. And so you have an asset that is harder to get, that is expanding in use, especially if we go down this Green New Deal agenda, uh, where we go away from fossil fuel and combustion engines into uh, battery powered, the need for silver is massively expansive. And then you have the wealthiest private investors in the world pulling it off the exchanges. They're always ahead of the little guy, the big money makers, the, the big people, the, the commercial banks, the central banks, the sovereign wealth funds, the people that run in those circles, they always win because they get the information before it's filtered down to the, to the average person on the street. And if you do nothing other than look at what they're doing and not look at the price, you'll see they're positioning ahead of whatever is coming next, this reset. And they are doing so by de-dollarizing and taking possession of gold and silver before they fully exert themselves. But when you talk about silver, I look at it as being the finest investment on the planet, the opportunity of a generation, because it is massively needed and it is disappearing in nature. And uh, you can see it by the actions of the big people and the big money. I think they're preparing for this. So it's going to be a bumpy ride. You got to trust your gut. You got to hang on. It's not going to be easy. But the wealthiest people in the world don't make decisions like this or, or show actions like they're doing, regardless of what the price is doing, without it being something very relevant. Now, I would like to just real quick, don't mean to dominate the conversation because you're it. asking really great <laughs> questions. But when we talk about price, I just want to explain one thing, okay? Let's go back to February 1st. February 1st, you had silver at 30 bucks. You had the Reddit group on the scene. Uh, you had more silver and gold put into the ETFs in, in that one or two days, February 1st and 2nd, than they've ever seen. You had all the online precious metals companies shut down that Friday night. Um, and I want to explain that for a minute, and then I'll, you'll see where I'm going with this. So typically, on a Friday, my head trader will say, Andy, what do you got for interviews this weekend? Anything I need to know about? Because the market is open 24-7 except on Friday at 5 p.m. Central, it sleeps until Sunday at 5 p.m. Central. Those two days of time, the market sleeps. So normally what I will do, he'll ask me, what do you got going? Because he will buy contracts on the COMEX into the weekend so that we can sell product that will be hedged over the weekend. So in the case of February 1st, I said, well, demand is off the charts. You know, I was in Florida at the time on a 10 day vacation, never left the house once except to go buy a new home. I bought a new home in Florida. I'm leaving Minnesota in a few weeks. That was the only time I left the house in a 10 day vacation. My kids were out on the beach the whole time and never left. I was working 18, 20 hours a day and dead serious. And my head trader calls me and says, what do you want to do for Friday? Uh, you know, the market close. I said, well, it's really busy. You should buy a bunch of contracts. So he bought 11 contracts, which at 5,000 ounces a piece is 55 thousand ounces long, meaning I can sell 55,000 ounces of silver and be hedged. Um, by Saturday morning, he calls me and he says, do you realize that we've sold 90,000 ounces already? You're 35,000 ounces exposed to the open. And he says, oh, by the way, all the online companies closed last night for the same reason. All of the online precious metals companies shut down their their websites because they didn't want to be naked exposed into the open. So I said, well, we got to close. I can't, you know, this could kill us. Uh, people were talking about the market opening up 10 bucks that day uh, with all this demand. That would have been meant I would have been out $350,000 like that. Now we have the ability to hedge it immediately when it opens. It still costs us $45,000, but we did. And for the first time in 31 years over that weekend, I shut down trading ever for the first time ever because of this demand. Now in this environment where record amount of physical demand, record amount of ETF demand, price at all, you know, flying high. Some genius decides to come on to COMEX uh, on February 1st in 
the pre-dawn hours in between when the New York market, or excuse me, when the London market closes and the New York market opens and dump 1.5 billion ounces of silver onto the market at the open. That's two years worth of global mine supply nearly. <clears throat> and that is 100% the best way to guarantee the worst possible execution. In fact, in real life, that person would be fired, probably prosecuted and maybe shot because you're guaranteeing the worst possible execution. What happened? Price of silver gets slammed, falls by three bucks, freaks out all, they're trying to freak people out by misdirecting with price and dumping what no rational person would do in the most bullish of environment. If you really want to maximize what your return would be, you bleed it out over a period of days or hours or even weeks at that amount of volume to guarantee the best price instead of dropping it like that and crushing the price is exactly what happens. So when we talk about price, understand it is a tool of misdirection. You have to look at the fundamentals and look at what the biggest people in the world are doing. They are accumulating it right now and they're using price as a tool to misdirect the public. Wow. That is such a fascinating explanation of what happened because everyone was like, we're in a bull market. We're going Reddit's got it. You know, we're, you know, and then all of a sudden it stopped and it dropped. Right, And it, the, we started off this conversation with just the notation that it's been very steady. Now is the time for everyone. If you can just buy a little bit of silver, I don't care if it's $100, $500, just get right. some physical in your hand because the yeah. indicators behind the scenes are huge. Yeah, right? for sure. For sure, they're, they're as big as they've ever been. And uh, the fundamentals behind silver could not be better. Uh, and, you know, we didn't even talk about the monetary side of things, what, what the Fed is doing with, you know, capping nominal rates and yield curve control and all of this stuff, which portray for the best possible environment on top of the demand side, whether it be industrial or monetarily, what the Fed is doing to the currency and the treasury, all but guarantee that, this is why the big money is doing what they're doing. This is why they are using price to misdirect the public while they continue to scoop up copious amounts of it and build massive positions under the cover of darkness and using the price to misdirect people. Hey, don't look here, look elsewhere, look at Bitcoin and look at the Dow Jones. That's all you need to see. And, you know, to, to a certain degree that that would have been okay. But um, if you want to prepare for what's coming, you have to not, focus on price and look at the, the economics of it, the math of it, and what the most sophisticated people in the world are doing and uh, quietly. And this is why when I say, if all you do is read the mainstream publications, you'll never get this. You may be well read in the news of the day, but you will not be well read in what really matters. Exactly, exactly. Andy, this has been an amazing interview. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that everybody needs to know? You know, uh, we could talk for hours. I know Michelle. we could. I, just, I know. <laughs> I, 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 I just think the bottom line is, is that if I could just say one thing about precious metals, don't look at it as an investment. Look at it as wealth that you hope you never need to use. And if you do, you're damn glad you have it. And if not, you give it to your kids or, your, or a charity or your nieces or your nephews or whatever. And just remember, for, for 5,000 years, it's been wealth. And when you see the most sophisticated players on the planet going to such great lengths, not only to blur the price, uh, but to accumulate it, whether it be the central banks, the commercial banks, the sovereign wealth funds, um, you know, it, it's happening right in front of us. And uh, when you see the U.S. government slap J.P. Morgan on the wrist with a 900 and, and $20 million fine for manipulating the, the gold and silver market. Yet that year they made a billion dollars in their precious metals trading desk, net gain 80, $80 million on top of still being allowed to run the SLV trust and another one, the largest silver trust in the world. Something's not right. They're being told from the highest up to go ahead and do this. And um, uh, again, I wouldn't focus on the manipulation but focus on the why. Why are they holding it back and accumulating it at the same time? Who are they doing it for? Is it the U.S. government? Is it the Chinese government on a deal they struck? Who is it? Uh, 
why are the central banks repatriating it? Repatriating it? Why level gold to a tier one reserve? Why do these things preemptively when the price doesn't isn't indicative of these actions. And that's why I would say price is a tool to misdirect. Look at the actions. It's the old, don't do what I say, do what I do. And if you do that regarding the wealthiest people in the world, you'll be taking money off the, taking chips off the table, putting them in your pocket. So when you leave the poker table, you go to the, to the cashier, you got money. So you walk out a winner. And, And I say that in respect to Dow Jones at all time highs, unjustified by the economy underneath it. Uh, or cryptocurrencies that have made people wealthy, take some of that wealth and turn it into something real. And then you walk away a winner no matter what. That's such good advice for everybody here to listen to. 99% of my audience have Bitcoin. Take some out. You've earned a lot of money. Put it in gold or especially silver. I would say put it in silver. I agree. Because the digital age needs silver, the green energy movement needs silver and just what um, Andy described everybody behind the scenes who is big is taking it off the table and there's only a definitive amount it's very interesting that right now the price is so affordable that's just another just huge quotient for this you've got nothing to lose Andy this has been so amazing we always love to have you here tell everyone where they can go to learn more about um, Miles Franklin so uh, we are building a new website, as I mentioned, uh, but we, our website that is up right now is milesfranklin.com. We are old school. We do things over the phone and by email for now. Um, you know, Michelle, we're very proud of our reputation. We've done this for 31 years without a customer complaint. We're one of only 27 authorized U.S. Mint representatives. We have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. We have worldwide exclusives uh, with Brinks that no one else has. Um, And we're licensed and bonded in the state of Minnesota, where our corporate office will remain, even though we have an office in Florida, and that's where I'm heading to. Our corporate office will stay here, largely because of the accreditation that uh, it provides us with the state of Minnesota, where we must be licensed and bonded, the only state in America that requires it in a federally non-regulated industry. Minnesota gives some accreditation and some oversight to an industry that needs it. Um, and we're very proud of that, and we, it, it holds us to a higher standard. So if people want to reach us, uh, they can go to our website. Our online store is closed, but do know this, that we've been pretty much beating every price in the country for the last 13 months. It takes a little bit of effort to figure it out because you're not going to see it as easily as you will with some of the online companies, but we will make it worth your listeners' interest and time. Uh, we'll make sure they get the best price. Personalized service in the state of Minnesota will guarantee that it goes smoothly on top of our reputation, which I will make sure it goes smoothly. And um, they can email us at info at Miles Franklin, either myself or one of the brokers that I've personally trained and most of which have been with us for 15 years or longer, will uh, respond, reach out uh, in inventory, answer questions and be there for a phone call. So for now, uh, we're thinking sometime down the road shortly, we will have online capabilities now that uh, we've been able to kind of deal with the um, identity theft issues with greater sophistication on that side of the table. But for now, it's a phone call and we will make it worth people's while or an email to info at Miles Franklin. Info at milesfranklin.com. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. Just want to clarify that for everybody. I also want to mention that you have a lowest price guarantee for our viewers especially. And I want them to write this down to remember it so that every time they purchase precious metals, because this adds up to a lot. What is that code, Andy, for everybody? They just need to put your name, Michelle, in the subject line. And uh, Michelle sent me. And if we have that, then we will make sure that they are treated with white glove service, the best possible price, period, which 99.999% of the time is by far the lowest. Now, when I say the lowest, I'd like to caveat that by saying from a major retailer in the industry. Sometimes there's, a, you know, on eBay or Craigslist or a local coin shop that that has a special that we can't compete with. Someone brought in some, some coins and sold them to them. They're trying to blow them out. But with all the online retailer, major companies in the industry. We've done a very good job at doing just that, at being the most competitive company around. And 
Uh, I'm very proud of that. Takes a little bit of effort, but we will make it happen. And on top of giving a service where you have accessibility and accountability and uh, not to say we haven't ever made a mistake, even though we've never had a customer complaint levied against us, we've made plenty of mistakes, but we make it right when we do. And uh, certainly if they come from you, we'll be very, very appreciative, happy to hear from, from these people and, uh, and make it worth their while. That I can assure you. So shop around at the accredited dealers. Make sure, do not buy from eBay. Do not, you know, this is not the time to put your money mm -hmm. at risk when you're putting your hard earned money into precious metals. Be sure you um, shop around at the highest level of accredited and then come back to Andy and say, look at what I found here. Yes, it exactly. It and it'll or beat it. it. Yep. Or beat it. Or be I didn't want to say it, but Usually he'll beat it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do our very best for sure. And thanks for having me, Michelle. I'd love to come back again. It's, it's an honor to be associated with fine people like yourself. And, uh, you know, I'm just a phone call away if you ever want to know what's going on because things change so darn rapidly. And uh, if you see things are changing and you want to hear what's going on, even if it's impromptu, please reach out. I'd love to come back. Thank you. It's such an honor. We will always have you back very soon. And we're going to keep having you back in these very fast changing times. It's so important for everybody to stay on top of what's happening, especially with yeah. the details and information you just shared. This has been fantastic. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming on the show today. It's my pleasure. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. You stay well. Yes, indeed. Mr. Andy Schechtman, owner and president of Miles Franklin LTD for the Industry Experts Panel. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.